Oh yes, let's continue. Um, <clears throat> so um, Paul says uh, that he did not go to Jerusalem after his encounter on the road to Damascus. Rather, it says that he went into Arabia. And then he says, later I returned to Damascus. Uh, but then when we go to Acts chapter 9, uh, we get a few additional details, uh, which kind of adds to what you know Paul is saying over here. So we'll uh, take a look at that. Uh, so if we could you know go to Acts chapter 9, uh, maybe we could begin by reading verses um, 17 to 19. Acts 9, 17 to 19, please. I hope you guys are back in the class. You go ahead, please. Yeah. Verses 17 to 19. Yeah. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight, forward and arose and was baptized. Verse 19. And, 19. and when he had received meat, yes, 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with his disciples, which were at Damascus. Okay, so um, he, so he's probably helped by people, uh, you know, and taken into Damascus after the encounter. And um, there you have the believer Ananias coming, and um, he places his hand on him, and um, you know Saul's temporary blindness is removed, and he's able to see. Then uh, the believers take him and they, you know, they baptize him, and then it says uh, he stays with them. It says Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Of course, it's not referring to the 11 disciples in Jerusalem. It's referring to the believers who are there in Damascus, you know, who offer immediate fellowship to him. And then verse 20 is so significant. It says, you know, Acts 9.20, it says, At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this on this name? And hasn't he come here to uh, take them as prisoners to the chief priests? So here is the man who has been creating havoc among people who call on this name. And now he is proclaiming this name and saying that this, this Jesus is the son of God, that he is indeed divine and that he has indeed risen from the dead. So uh, you see, uh, Paul begins to preach his gospel at once, a few days after his recovery. So I mean, I don't know, maybe it was 10 days, 12 days or whatever, you know, during uh, which time uh, he is baptized and um, he stays there with them and he begins to regain his strength. And at once he begins to go around the synagogues and start preaching. So the gospel was revealed to him in the very first few initial days. It's not some great revelation that came to him uh, much later on. And uh, so we get to know that he begins to immediately preach the gospel that has been revealed to him by Jesus Christ. And then, um, you know, as he starts getting more and more popular and everyone starts believing in what uh, he has taught and they place their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and when that happens, then we see in Acts chapter 9, verses 23 to 25, what happens, what's the consequence of his uh, preaching of the gospel. So if we could have someone read out Acts 9, 23 to 25. 
When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in basket. Yes. So it says after many days. So we do not know how many weeks or months he continued to minister in uh, Damascus. And then the Jews, they decide, OK, fine. Now this man has clearly gone to the other side. He's not going to come back to our side. And so they decide to kill him. And then uh, once it says his followers you know, um, uh, helped him, So which means by now uh, he has gained enough uh, uh, trust where people are willing to listen to his teaching and you know be uh, allow themselves to be discipled by him so now he in fact he even has followers and so they um, rescue him in the during the night time you know they they help him escape and uh, if you are, if you continue to read acts chapter 9 and you go on to verse 26 you get the impression that now immediately after this he goes to jerusalem but now because of the galatian letter we discover that uh, he does not after they let him down in that basket and you know and he escapes from there he actually does not go to jerusalem we we get that impression in acts chapter 9 because over there you know luke is just condensing the whole narrative uh, but from the galatian letter we discover that after being let down in the basket he goes to arabia for a little while so it's not that he's going to go to arabia going over there to uh, arabia uh, you know to find out what the gospel is, uh, you know, wait upon God and find out what the gospel is. He already has had a revelation. He already has received the gospel. Now maybe, you know, God is just going to give him in greater detail, more details. Maybe God is going to train him up more. So we don't really know with, with what purpose the Holy Spirit leads him into Arabia. Uh, so uh, that is the sequence of events. So we have the road uh, to Damascus event. And then after that, he comes to Damascus, where he stays with the believers uh, and immediately begins to preach in all the synagogues in Damascus. His ministry goes on for weeks, months. We do not know. It doesn't specify. And then there is a position. There's a plot to kill him and finish him. And the followers that he now has, they uh, help him. They lower him down in a basket and he escapes without you know the Jews finding out. And after he escapes, he goes into Arabia. So um, in Arabia, maybe God reconfirmed the gospel that has been, uh, you know, that has been revealed to him. Maybe he uh, maybe the Lord gave him additional details. We do not really know. But one thing we know, whatever he began preaching right from the beginning was a revelation from Jesus Christ directly. And uh, and now here in your uh, back when you, when we come back to Galatians chapter one verse eighteen we get to know that it was three years later that um, the Jerusalem event happens uh, because if we were to look at Acts chapter nine verses twenty six and twenty seven we think that maybe he immediately went to Jerusalem but uh, we find out here so let's first look at uh, Galatians 1, 18 to 24. And then we'll briefly come back to the Acts chapter 9. And then from after that, we'll move on to other matters. Um, so right now, if someone could please read out Galatians 1, 18 to 24. Yeah. Pastor, can I read? Please go ahead. So then after three years, uh, years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained uh, with 15, uh, within 15 days. But I saw none of other apostles expect, uh, except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterwards, I went into the regions of Syria and uh, Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, he, were, he who formerly persecuted us now, preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy and they glorified and they they glorified god in me thank you thank yes you. so he's you know um giving uh the details so he says um 
it is only three years later that I went to Jerusalem. And even then, it's not like as if I went and consulted all of the apostles. I spent 15 days with Peter. And then, you know, he also seems to have met uh, James. And he says, I did not meet any, any of the others. So you see, it's not the, this is not uh, the gospel I'm preaching. It's not something which I picked up from different people and put it together. No, it was given to me by uh, Jesus Christ. And um, then he goes on to say that from there he went to Syria and Cilicia. Now, just um, you know, briefly coming to Acts chapter 9, 26 and 27, gives, which gives us some details about what happened when he went to Jerusalem, what occurred. You know, because uh, in the letter, he does not give details about what happened when he went over there three years later. But when we look at Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, we get some clarity on what happened when he actually turned up over there uh, three years after his conversion. If someone could read out Acts 9, 26 and 27, please. Well, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to, attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. But they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Thank you. So um, he's been doing ministry work for three years now. And after three years of ministry, he finally goes to meet these apostles, the people who had been in direct contact with Jesus. So he goes after three years over there. And nobody wants to meet him uh, because they're all very, very scared of him. Uh, you know, even after three years of hearing all these bits of news that, you know, here's this man who's been preaching about Christ and all that. Uh, so uh, they are afraid to meet him. And then it is Barnabas who takes him, you know, to uh, to Peter. I just say so here brought him to the apostles. But then because Peter tells us that, um, because Paul tells us that, um, he met only with Peter and with James. So we, are, we have to assume that Barnabas must have taken him to Peter and maybe later on to James. And um, this is what Barnabas tells. He says he told them how Saul you know, on his journey saw the Lord. And it says um, how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas confirms that this person has been preaching in Damascus fear, fearlessly for almost three years now. So we're not very sure how long uh, um, Paul was in Arabia, but it was probably just for a few uh, weeks or a few months because it looks like, you know, he says in his Galatian letter, I came back to Damascus. And here even Barnabas is saying that he was doing a ministry in Damascus. So he probably spent that time alone time in Arabia for just maybe a few weeks or a few months after which he goes back to Damascus he continues his he continues his ministry in Damascus so Barnabas is basically telling you know here is a man who's been preaching the gospel for three years so he's definitely on the Lord's side and he can be trusted and so after Barnabas kind of you know certifies uh, him then the uh, then uh, these apostles are more willing to accept him. So, what is the point in him telling all of this? He wants them to clearly know that uh, he, uh, whatever he is telling is the truth, and he goes on to give more details. Um, and it's all interesting for us because we kind of begin to get a little background on Paul and what ac actually happened. You know, so. Um, uh, it does help. So let's move into chapter two and look uh, look at you know further details that he is providing us regarding his time. Um, so Galatians chapter two, if we could read out verses one to five, please. Then after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and said before them. Though privately before those who seem influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus was with me, was not forced to be 
circumcised though he was awake, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Yes. So when he went, after three years when he went, uh, he only met with Peter and with James. And they must have had some personal, private conversations. We don't know what was discussed. And now the next trip that he makes to Jerusalem is 14 years later. So 14 years after his conversion, he is now going for the second time to Jerusalem. And this time he goes along with Barnabas and with um, uh, Titus. And at this time, uh, he, uh, he goes because of some revelation that he has received. He does not say exactly what that revelation was. Uh, maybe it had something to do with what this, you know, this, uh, you know, Judaizers are doing and uh, the problems that they are creating. So maybe uh, it was regarding that. But he goes over there with Barnabas and with Titus, and he has a private meeting with the leaders, it says. Um, he chooses Barnabas because Barnabas had been, you know, uh, specifically appointed along with him to work among the Gentiles. Uh, and, uh, you know, it looks like this whole discussion was regarding Gentiles and what the Judaizers are doing. So <clears throat> he takes Barnabas with him. He also takes Titus with him for this meeting, most probably because Titus was a Gentile. OK, he was a Gentile, but now he was in charge of all the churches in the Crete region. Um, so he takes Titus and Barnabas and he goes to this private meeting. And uh, we do not know what, what the discussions are, but the outcome is this. They decide that Titus, even though he is a Gentile, he does not need to be circumcised. He can continue doing his ministry. He can continue being a leader and you know sharing the gospel and running the church. And he in no way does he need to follow any of the Jewish rituals. That is what is decided in the meeting that they have. Um, and uh, so Paul says in verse 4, this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks. And you know they were saying that you have to be a slave to uh, the Jewish rituals and all of that. And uh, so um, both he and the leaders in Jerusalem, it says, we did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved. And so uh, <clears throat> we discover that uh, whatever Paul had been preaching, whatever Paul had been teaching for 14 years now was perfectly in sync with what the Jerusalem believers what were teaching. So the Jerusalem believers could not find any defect in what Paul had been preaching all of these years. And in fact, he goes on to, to talk about that. Um, if we could read out verses 6 to 10, and we look into the important points that are being made over here. Verses 6 to 10, please. Um, is it uh, Galatians uh, 2, 6 to 10. Please read, brother. Oh, okay, thank you. But from uh, those who uh, seem to those be something, who... go ahead. Uh, okay, no, no problem. We should continue. Okay. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me, God. It, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and say to the circumcised, they, des they desired 
only that, that, that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Yes. Uh, two very uh, important points that we see here. Uh, first thing, uh, it, it, verse 6, it, he, he says, as for those who were held in high esteem, you know, he's referring to the um, the leaders in Jerusalem, these apostles who had literally um, been with Jesus during his uh, you know physical days on earth. So these people who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. Uh, God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. So they were not able to add something to the gospel which Paul had been preaching for the last 14 years. It, whatever Paul had been preaching was complete. The revelation that Jesus had given to him was complete. It's not like it was lacking in any way. And now these um, apostles added to it. No. Already what had been revealed to uh, Paul was complete in every way. And so he says, even though these people were in a, you know, have been held in such high esteem, they added nothing to my message. I had already received everything there was to receive from Jesus directly. And um, the other thing that he says is, uh, whatever they were, you know, however high uh, an esteem in which they were held, that makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. So uh, the point he is making is, um, it's true that they are people who got trained by Jesus day and night. Uh, and it's true that you know uh, Jesus spent a lot of time you know molding them, shaping them. But God is not someone who shows favoritism because He did the same thing with me. Okay, is so what He's trying to say. Um, so it makes no difference to me that uh, people think that they are better trained than me because I know the truth. I know the fact that God has shows no partiality. In the same way He trained them, He trained me too. In the same way He anointed them, He anointed me too. So in the eyes of the world, they may be held in higher esteem. But in God's eyes, who shows no favoritism, I know that I'm on equal, you know, uh, on an equal footing with the other apostles. So please accept what I am preaching as the truth. Uh, you know, so uh, it, it's the you know plea that he's making to these Galatians. So in fact, those leaders, you know, when they're having this uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, after 14 years, they admit, they recognize the fact that the full gospel has been given even to Paul. And in fact, they are so glad that uh, you know God has assigned them uh, to do work among the Gentiles. And so they say, please go ahead, do the work for which you know God has appointed you. Uh, so uh, they 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 bless uh, Barnabas and uh, you know Paul and say, you know, we are. Um, we are giving you our support, our right hand of fellowship. We will stand with you in the work that you are doing. And uh, in the meantime, you know, Peter will do the work that he's meant to do, you know, uh, among the circumcised. Um, yeah, so all of that they say. Only one uh, a single thing they ask for, they say, you know, please do continue to remember the poor. And I think actually they were referring to uh, the um, the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem was a very poor church. You see, in these other places where you had uh, Gentiles, you know, coming to the church, they were in a well-off position. The people in Jerusalem were very persecuted because, you see, all the Jews had turned against them. They had been cut off from their relatives. They were snubbed when they went out in public. Um, uh, I think we really should appreciate these people in the Jerusalem church. They were making a lot of sacrifices to to hold on to the to their faith in Jesus. And so, you know, um, one one thing they say, you know, you go, you do your ministry among the Gentiles, but please remember the poor, uh, which is why we see that later, you know, Paul makes a collection. You know, he collects money from all the churches, and he wants to send it to Jerusalem to help those uh, poor believers who are like, you no, know, literally. Um, struggling day by day on a day-to-day -day level, you know, for their sustenance. So um, I think they must have been in a really poor state. And it's so beautiful that they held on to their faith in spite of all the persecution that they were facing, you know. So um, 
So except for that one requirement which they ask for, they say you just go ahead and do whatever ministry God has committed uh, to you. So um, now just coming to this uh, whole thing about, you know, uh, it sounds a little, you know, the translation is such that it sounds a little rude that Paul said the things that he did, but uh, he was just making a very, you know, uh, frank statement. He was not being boastful in, in any way when he says, you know, as for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. He's not saying it in a boastful way. He's just pointing it out that in God's eyes, all are equal and God assigns different responsibilities to different people. The whole, um, uh, uh, in the end, of course, when it comes to the time of rewards, God will see how sincere each person has been in the task that has been given to them. The problem with humans doing ranking is that we tend to uh, pit one person uh, against another. And you know, depending on how, um, how, how much they are visible in the public eye and how uh, talented they seem you know, when it comes to human standards, based on that, we tend to rank people. But God's ranking is very different. He looks at the matters of the heart. He looks at, uh, you know, if somebody is involved in the ministry of um, hospitality, God is going to be seeing with what attitude they're doing it, how sincerely they're doing it, how many people they're reaching out to, how prayerfully they are doing their work. God looks at all of those things, and then he does his ranking according to that, and the rewards in heaven will be according to that. Here on earth, uh, people look at um, another set of, uh, you know, um, they, they have another set of things that they look at when they are uh, ranking people. So, you know, even if we were to make a comparison between, you know, James, you know, who were Peter and James, like who were the pillars of the church, there are three persons mentioned, right, as pillars, James and Peter and John, yeah. Now, who would we say, you know, is greater? Um, Peter and James and John, they were the pillars of the Jerusalem church. Now, if it had not been for these leaders, probably the Jerusalem church would have collapsed in the sense they were under so much pressure, those believers, those new believers uh, who were just desperately trying to hold on to their faith in spite of all the persecution that they were facing. And it was the leaders like this who helped them who encouraged them, prayed for them, sustained them, um, probably went to their homes and sat with them and you know, uh, strengthened them in the word of God and all of that. So these were really pillars. They are the ones who kind of led the church through its early days and, and caused it to grow and caused it to become stronger until you know a time when pressure was off and things began to get better and people could just stand on their own. So what these pillars or uh, these three pillars did for the church is absolutely vital it's amazing what they did but then when you look at what paul accomplished that also was great because while these pillars were focusing on the jerusalem church and keeping it going they could not go to other places and do and spread the gospel on the other hand paul was able to accomplish that he could go through you know up uh, throughout asia minor and spread the gospel so he did his part and God, in fact, used him to write 28% uh, of the New Testament is written by Paul. So who, who would we say is greater? Who should be held in higher esteem? We can't do the ranking because each of them in their own way try to do the best that they could with the task which had been given to them. So uh whenever in our minds we we start ranking people you know let's be a little more careful how we do that because god may not be pleased with that kind of uh, ranking um because uh he never looked at who had better preaching ability paul or apollos because apollos you know we we get to know was like really fluent in the way he spoke amazing man he, he could hold the attention of the crowds on the other hand, when Paul preached, one guy fell asleep and you know actually fell down from the window. So, um, um, oh, was oh, yeah, right, yeah. Forgot my example, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, some people um, may be more talented, and some people may not be as talented. 
but ranking is not based on that. Uh, God looks at a different set of things when he you know, uh, rewards people for the ministry that they are doing. All right. Um, verses 11 and 11 to 13, if we could read. Um, Galatians, Galatians 2. OK. Galatians 2, 11 to 13. Yes. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Yeah. So um, Antioch is basically the place, you know, uh, the entire region of Antioch is basically where Paul is doing his ministry. And so Peter comes over there to visit at some point of time. <laughs> and when Peter comes over there on his visit, you know, um, he's friendly with the Gentile believers. He, uh, when they're having the Lord's Supper, he sits along with them in their group and he eats with them. Uh, because that's basically what the Lord's Supper represents, right? I mean, um, it shows how we all belong to one body. We are united, you know, uh, by Christ and we are feeding on him. The life that we now have, it is through him. And that's basically what the Lord's Supper represents. And so we, it's supposed to bring out the unity among us. And so Peter, when he comes over here to Antioch, he sits with the Gentiles, he eats with them. Uh, and after all, Peter is the man who had that vision, you know, on the rooftop where God appears to him and asks him to eat all the animals that are there in the sheet. And he says, oh, no, Lord, how can I do that? There are unclean animals over here and I cannot touch them. And then God says, what I have made clean, you can no longer call unclean. Yes, under the Mosaic covenant, at that stage, there were still certain things which were clean and certain things which were unclean because of the way God you know, uh, worked only in one single nation at that particular time. But now that has passed. Christ has come. Through Christ, uh, salvation you know, has been opened up to all peoples who no longer need to keep the Mosaic law alone to be you know, accepted by God. So now it's a completely different story. So what now God has declared as clean, no human has the right to call unclean. So all of this revelation Peter has already received. He already knows all of that. And so he's freely mingling with the Gentiles, eating with them and treating them as equals. And then when these Judaizers come along, because they are so respected, because they're so influential, maybe they, their speaking skills are so excellent. When they begin to talk, Peter begins to feel uncomfortable. And he does not want to have a confrontation with them. And it's very, very shocking that someone of Peter's stature starts distancing himself from the Gentiles. And do you think the Gentiles would not have observed that? Would they not have felt really hurt? Because you see, he was rubbing shoulders with them and treating them as equals. But then when these people come along, he starts distancing himself. When they meet together and having the Lord's Supper, you know, they all sit in groups and eat, right? Um, so he's no longer sitting with the Gentiles. He's now sitting only with the Jews. How would they have felt? And when Paul sees this, he is so upset. And so he publicly confronts Peter and he says, what you are doing is wrong. You know, he, he, calls, he calls out Peter on what he is doing. And he says, see, what you're doing is wrong. Um, and um, so we kind of get the impression that these Judaizers, whoever on earth they were, were really powerful people, influential people. Maybe the arguments which they used were very, sounded very convincing. And the gospel, on the other hand, sounded too simple, too basic. All the gospel does is revolve around Jesus Christ. And that must have probably sounded too simplistic. And so even Peter, who knows the gospel and has stood up for it, is now kind of using double standards. He still knows the truth. He still believes it. But he doesn't want any kind of confrontation with them. And so 
the safe thing to do is just to avoid the Gentiles whenever they are around. And Paul does not like this attitude. And so, you know, he kind of uh, um, confronts him regarding that. Um, so that we find in verses 14. Okay, verse 14. If, if you could read out verse 14, please. Ma'am, verse 14. Mm. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Kephas before them all, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Okay, so um, he says you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile. So from the time that God you know, gave him that revelation on the rooftop, he eats like the way the Gentiles eat. He no longer, you know, uh, avoids pork, no longer avoids certain foods. He goes ahead and, you know, eats everything that is placed in front of him. Uh, so even though he is a Jew, he has started living like a Gentile based on the revelation that God has given him. But now, suddenly, he's trying to avoid the Gentiles. Okay, so, uh, and now he's becoming very, very careful about keeping only Jewish customs and not, uh, you know, not eating the other foods and all of that. And the Gentile believers are observing this. And so, uh, you see, Peter never opened his mouth and said, oh, you must follow Jewish rituals. But in his behavior, in the way he is treating the Gentiles, he's in, without even speaking any words he's sending out the message if you guys want to be accepted then you guys better start behaving like jews and keep our ceremonial purity rituals and all of that then you will not no longer be second grade people but you will be our equals and so uh, over here the words that paul uses he says how is it then that you force gentiles to follow jewish customs but Peter never uttered a word. He never said, you people must follow Jewish rules. How is he putting force on them? Non-verbal communication. By distancing himself from them, by no longer treating them as equals, he's kind of putting pressure on them to start acting like Jews, You know, to start adopting all the Jewish customs and holidays and rituals and all of that to make themselves more acceptable. And Paul says, this is not right. You know, you you who are not even living like a Jew anymore have no right to force other people to start following Jewish customs. OK, so he actually confronts um, Peter regarding that particular matter. Um, yeah, we have one person raising a hand. Uh, I'll just make the point attached, you know, the point which I want to make attached to this particular thing and then yeah uh, you know we can come to the question so all i just wanted to you know add over here is that um sometimes a pastor or a preacher may not say something but people don't just follow whatever is being said they also very much follow the actions and behavior and conduct of the persons who are you know uh, presenting the gospel and preaching so it's People in leadership need to be very careful with also the, their conduct, the, their behavior, uh, the words that they say, uh, the words that they speak are important, but also their actions and their non-verbal communication becomes important because people learn even from that. Uh, so yes, that's just the point that I wanted to make, you know, in line with uh, what is being said over here. So yes, uh, if we could come to your, uh, Shri Kumar, yes, if we could come to your question, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I just want to know that, as you said right now, that it is uh, actually indirectly, uh, he was actually sending a message or he was encouraging the Jewish custom. So my question is that, um, um, or is it is it because of the fear of what he's having on the Jews? What he is that was the reason that he he actually you know um, separated himself from the Gentile, or actually he is still believing on the Jewish for Jewish custom and um, indirectly he was actually teaching the thing. I just want to know that whether it is it is because of the fear of Jews he did that, 
or mm. or he was actually encouraging the people to also follow the jewish custom that's my question whether he was moved by the fear or it was actually indirectly uh, sending him a message that you should follow jewish custom that's my question thank you pastor yeah you know when uh, was 13 it says the other jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even barnabas was led astray um and yeah then he goes on to make the point about uh, um in in 11 he says when safest came to antioch i opposed him to his face so when he say when he uses the term over here led astray did they start believing the teachings of the judaizers not at least in barnabas case maybe he began to wonder whether those teachings may be correct so because the wording over here is barnabas was led astray but when it comes to peter what is it just say it says um, i opposed him to his face and he stood condemned and then um, he says they were not acting in line with the truth at least in peter's case i don't think peter was led astray i think he was just being hypocritical um you know because he says you're a jew yet you live like a gentile and not like a jew how is it then you force gentiles double standards so maybe in barnabas case he was led astray because the words used over there is led astray so maybe he began to wonder whether there is some truth in what the judaizers are, say, are saying maybe he began to wonder whether you need something additional extra to believe in jesus christ to gain salvation but in peter's case i think he knew the truth inside out he was just trying to play it safe um he didn't want a confrontation with those persons maybe because they were so influential maybe if he got into a debate and argument with them he would not be able to express himself as clearly as them uh, you know um because maybe he's not as fluent in the way he expresses himself in the way those people are able to you know present their case don't know what exactly it is but he was being hypocritical yeah is it is it lack of uh, courage or uh, is it because of uh... fear he did that that's my question do you think that it is because of the fear of it? well the word fear is not used over here and yeah, what that, he was that, afraid no, no. of <laughs> so we cannot be too judgmental you know after we are talking about <laughs> peter so i don't yeah. really want to say anything dangerous because in the go... past also <laughs> it, he had so yeah. much fear when jesus was actually arrested and all so that time also he was so much fear so that's why i just wanted to know that oh, okay yeah um, in, in the background of that yes he yeah. was yeah he was a man no. uh, full of fear at that time uh, yeah. but then that fear went down the drain on the day when the, the <laughs> flames of fire came and rested on their heads yeah that he is also there yes. he immediately comes out stands in front of the crowd and just preaches his heart out and there are 3000 people you know added to the church that yeah, day okay. so he okay. was probably not fearful anymore but over here it may have been more a fear of i mean how do i express myself to those people how do i debate ah, okay. with them better to, better ah, to just okay. avoid a confrontation ah, okay. so it is probably more that yeah. not too much confident yeah okay thank you pastor yeah thank you i mean that happens <laughs> uh with me when some people come and start you know uh, debating the scripture and they are really good at the w- at the way they express in their case i know what the, what they are saying is wrong but i don't have the words to express my side of it and yeah, rather than <laughs> i just say uh, i just say okay brother and i just leave it at that because uh, you know i don't i'm not able to express myself as clearly as them and and uh, so it could have been just that but he should yeah, not have yeah, yeah he he should not have distanced himself from the gentiles because that would have hurt them uh yeah so that was a wrong thing to do thank you pastor yes uh yeah all right uh, if someone could read out verses 15 to 18 please yeah we're almost out of time but yeah 15 to 18 we are so such Jews by birth and not gentle sinners gentile sinners Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. 
So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Yeah. Okay. Um Okay, let's look at this particular verse 17. Okay, but if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuilt what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Okay, so just based on these verses, it looks like as if the Judaizers were saying, oh, you people are saying that you are followers of Christ and that you have been made righteous by Christ. But look at you people. You're also committing sins. On the other hand, at least we people who keep the Mosaic law, you know, we have all these rules. We have 613 Mosaic laws and we have all these additional laws which were you know, developed by the Pharisees. So we try to follow all of these rules. And so we are better off at avoiding sin than you people who are claiming to be righteous. So isn't your Christ actually promoting sin? You know, it's probably the kind of argument that the Judaizers were using. And so here in verse 18, Paul says, if I rebuild what was destroyed, you know, the Mosaic law, the covenant which Jesus said is cancelled, if I try to re rebuild that, you know what? I would end up being a greater lawbreaker than if I did committed some other sin. So the it's a case that he's building up against what the Judaizers have been claiming. So he says, it is true that we Christians, you know, sin. And when we sin, we go to the Lord and we, you know, we confess and we repent. Uh, but a greater sin would be to bring back the Mosaic law just because, you know, we are not being perfect in our walk with Christ. Just because, you know, we are still, you know, ending up in sin now and then. Just because of that, if we bring back the Mosaic law and start following it to make ourselves holy, you know what? We would be greater lawbreakers. We would actually become breakers of God's law. Uh, so the solution is not uh, to go back to the Mosaic law. The solution to leading a righteous life, you know, is to uh, live in God. Uh, and so he goes on to say, you know, I have been, uh, he says in verse 19, 20, he says, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. On that day when I made a commitment to Jesus Christ, I was symbolically crucified along with him and I died to the Mosaic law. I don't need to follow that law anymore. On the other hand, how do I live a righteous life now? He says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. I'm going to trust him to sanctify me i'm going to hold on to him and learn to walk in victory like it says in galatians 5 step day by day i will walk in step with the with the spirit and put to death the flesh because i have already been crucified with christ and in that way i will learn to walk into greater and greater uh, you know sanctification it's going to be a process but this process is going to happen through faith in christ he is going to make me holy. I am not going to rebuild the Mosaic law and go back to it because that is something that God, Jesus Christ himself, canceled. And if I go back and rebuild it, what a great sinner I would be. What a great lawbreaker I would be, you know, is, is the point that uh, Paul is making. So he basically concludes with that. He's trying to say, hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trust him, follow him, walk you know, uh, with his help, do not go back to the Mosaic law. That is not the solution. That will not make you righteous in any sense of the word. Okay, so um, this is the basic, um, you know, uh, summation of what he is trying to bring out in these first two chapters. And then, of course, you know, next class we'll you know go into the next few chapters. Um, so, uh, yeah, we uh, maybe we can finish with this that it's, it's it's in fact time yeah let's close with a word of prayer we thank you so much oh lord that um, you have given us a gospel of freedom 
a good news of freedom. We can try to keep law after law, rule after rule on our own, O oh Lord, and we will not be able to do it. But if we place our faith in you and trust you to assist us on a day-to-day -day basis, which in fact you will do, then, O oh Lord, we can truly be free from sin. We can truly walk into the um, sanctification and righteousness which you have for us. So thank you, O oh Lord, that we never have to go back to rules and regulations and rituals, which can never actually ever set us free. But through faith, simple faith in Jesus Christ, we can become very victorious. We can live an amazing Christian life by your power, with your help, through the guidance of your spirit. Thank you, O oh Lord, that the good news you have given us is really good news because you take 99% of the burden on yourself in, in helping us become who we are meant to be. We just have to walk by your side and cooperate with you. That's the 1% that we need to do from our side. Thank you that you have given us such a good, good news, a good gospel. We thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless us even as we um, go through the rest of the course and even as we go through the rest of the epistles. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, we'll meet again next week. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.